But before any further, let's just pause and ask for a blessing <coughs> on our thoughts this morning. <coughs> Lord, we do give you thanks for your blessings. We thank you for the wonder of your love for us. A love that led you to go all the way to the cross, to die on our behalf, to shed your blood that we might be forgiven from our sins, that we might know the joy of everlasting life. Lord, we thank you that the story doesn't end with death and the grave, but it ends with you having risen again, triumphant over sin and death, living forevermore with hope and promise, with joy and peace to all who put their faith in you. Lord, we thank you that we can experience that right now in our lives today. We don't have to wait to some point in the future when you call us to your heavenly kingdom, but we can experience your blessings right now. We thank you for that. Lord, we pray your blessing upon our thoughts this morning as we look into your word. We pray that you would remove from our minds anything that would distract us. Help us to focus our attentions upon your word, to hear your voice as your Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts. We will give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Fear. Fear is a powerful emotion. Sooner or later, we're all going to face it in our lives. Learning to overcome fear is one of the great challenges of life. If you don't overcome fear, then fear will overcome you. We can be afraid of all sorts of things. We can be afraid of failure, afraid of financial loss, afraid of illness or of dying. We can be afraid of change, afraid of the future, of what uh, is to come. Fearful. At the moment, uh, a lot of people are fearful about the rise in the cost of living, not really knowing what uh, is going to happen in the months ahead, and whether or not we can meet all our financial obligations. People can be afraid of other people, afraid of what they think, of what they think about us, afraid of what they might do, or what they might do to us. Fear can paralyze. Sometimes fear can motivate you can galvanize us into action to do things that we might not otherwise have done, either for good or for ill. But fear can also hold you down. It can keep you back from doing those things that need to be done. Fear can dominate your life like a tyrant holding you in its grip and you can't seem to break free. Plato the ancient Greek philosopher said, we can easily forgive a child who's afraid of the dark. The real tragedy of life is men who are afraid of the light. Quite a statement. And that's where a lot of people are today. Full of fears, yes, but they're afraid to come to the light. Jesus says, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. Jesus says, to us, come to me and your souls will find rest. And yet people, filled with fears, will try anything, almost anything else, but to come to Jesus. The like the wounded animal has been backed into the corner that lashes out in fear at the hand that's extended to help them. I think I'm right in saying that the most repeated command in all the Bible is fear not. Uh, I understand that it's found in the Bible 365 times. Quite interesting, isn't it? One command for each day of the year. <coughs> Commands like Joshua chapter 1 and verse 9 that says, Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid. Neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. The message of the angels at Christmas was, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. John chapter 14 and verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Take all these promises together and so many more. And then we come to our text for today, Psalm 91, this amazing psalm. 
What a source of encouragement. What blessed promises we find here. Promises for the soul that is struggling with fear. Promises of help, of overcoming power, of peace to the soul. Promises that are backed up with the assurance of God's love for us. I've taken as my text this morning, verses 7 and 8, where it says, A thousand shall fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Here, the psalmist is actually quoting from an earlier portion of the scripture. If you want to keep your thumb there for just a minute, or, or otherwise just listen, but the passage is in Leviticus chapter 26. That's the third book in the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and chapter 26 is nearly the very end of the book. Leviticus chapter 26, but I want to read just a couple of verses from this passage. It begins in verse 3 with a statement, If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then I will give you rain in due season, and the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. And your threshing shall reach unto the vintage, and the vintage shall reach unto the sowing time. And you shall eat your bread to the full, and dwell in your land safely. And I will give peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. I will rid evil beasts out of the land, neither shall the sword go through your land. And you shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. Five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. And your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. For I will have respect unto you, make you fruitful and multiply, and establish my covenant with you. Here you see the same promise restated again in Psalm 91. The idea that a thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but the danger will not come near you. A promise of deliverance, a promise of peace, a promise of overcoming power. But I want you to notice to whom the promise is made. In Leviticus, it says in verse 3, If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them. You see, the reality is this, that deliverance from the Lord is not promised to everyone, but to those who obey his commandments. Now you come back to Psalm 91, and the opening verse of the psalm says, to him that dwells in the secret place of the Most High. He is the one that shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Notice that the promise of deliverance here again is given to the one who is dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. Basically saying the same thing as the passage in Leviticus. The psalm, so full of the promise of deliverance, of deliverance from fear, is not a psalm addressed to just anyone. No, the promise is given specifically to those who are living daily in close fellowship with the Lord. Do you remember when you were a little child? Maybe you had gone out with your mum and dad to the shops, or you were away on holiday, but you were somewhere <coughs> in the crowds of strange people, and you being little, you couldn't see about their heads and shoulders. Lost them. And then all of a sudden, you couldn't see mom and dad. You lost sight of them. Do you remember the fear that uh, went through you when you couldn't see them? And then, of course, the, uh, the, the great rush of relief when you found them again. The safety that you felt just being near them, holding their hands, walking by their side. Deliverance from fear overcoming power, the peace that passes all understanding. All these things are promised to us when we stay close to His Son. It's when we stray away from the Lord that our fears increase. The secret to spiritual strength and overcoming power lies in how close we are to God. Think about Gideon, one of the great stories of the Old Bible. 
In his time, uh, they, they, uh, <coughs> they were subject to uh, the Midianites, a, a powerful neighboring nation. Every year, about the time of harvest, when they would gather in their crops to help them get through the winter months, the Midianites would show up in huge bands and sweep through the land and steal everything, take off with the, the harvest. And this went on for years, and so the, the Israelites languished in, in poverty, and the land was struggling, people were struggling to survive. So God comes to Gideon and tells him, uh, I'm going to bring deliverance to the land. If you will uh, 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 take the lead, gather about an army, and, uh, and fight these Midianites, I will see to it that you will be delivered. So Gideon sent out a call, and we're told in the scriptures that 32,000 men showed up to help fight. They were all tired of being continually at the mercy of the Midianites and their raiding hordes, and so everybody was ready to do something about it. But God came to Gideon and said, Gideon, there's too many people here, so I, I, I want you to send home everyone who is afraid. Tell them there's no shame in it. But if you're afraid, you've got families back home, and you're afraid of going to battle, go home. Well, 22,000 men took him up as their word, and he walked home. He lost two-thirds of his army in one swoop. Now he's left with only 10,000. And yet God came back to Gideon a second time and said, still too many people. So he says, what I want you to do is to take them down to the water side, let them all get a drink of water. And he said, those that lay flat on the ground and put their faces into the water, send them home. But those who don't, who keep watchful, who uh, kneel and scoop the water up. He said, those I want you to keep. I, I guess perhaps the idea was, you know, if you're in a, a time of, of, of war and, and danger, and the ones that ran down to the, the waterfront and threw off their swords and their armor and their shields and flat, plastered their face in the water, they were vulnerable. But the ones who kept the spear in one hand and scooped the water and kept their eyes watching were looking for danger. They were the ones that were ready, prepared, should an emergency arise. So God says, those ones I want you to keep. So by the time that this went, test went through, they lost some more men. Gideon was down to 300. 300 men. And God said, now that's plenty. And think about that the enemy was thousands and thousands of times larger than, than uh, these 300 men. So what are the chances that we have? God said, no, I want you to, do, to, to realize and I want you to learn a lesson. That the secret to victory doesn't lie in yourself and in your numbers and in your greatness and in your own strength. The secret to victory lies in trusting in me. Even when the odds were greatly stacked against them, even when the situation seemed impossible from a human standpoint, God was able to bring deliverance. There's a story of Samson. One of the more familiar stories in the Bible, Samson, the, the strong man, and how God, you know, had raised up Samson again to, to help uh, uh, fight uh, on behalf of the people against the Philistines, another nation that was oppressing the land at the time. And how God enabled Samson to do some extraordinary things. But Samson began to take God's blessing for granted. He took his eyes off God. He became a bit arrogant and careless. He relied increasingly on his own strength to get him through, on his own wit and wisdom, which he did not, apparently didn't have much of. <laughs> but only when he was taken by the enemy, only when he was humiliated in defeat, only when he was only then when he was confronted with uh, the true nature of his weakness. It was only then that he learned the lesson that deliverance comes from the Lord. The story of David and Goliath. He was a little boy. He told the story barely out of his teenage years. A young man. He went down uh, taking some bread and some cheese to his brothers who were in the, the camp at that point. They were on the battlefield, the Philistines on one side, the Israelites on the other. They were preparing for battle. And, and so his father sent David down into the camp to see how his brothers were getting on, how they were doing. And uh, David got there and found them all cowering, hiding away in their tents. And out on the plain there in the battlefield was the Philistine champion, a man by the name of Gal Goliath, a huge man, in armor and a huge spear and a great shield. And he stood there challenging 
the Israelites, dare anyone to come out and fight me? And basically, I'll rip you to pieces and throw you to the birds of the air. Something along that line. Nobody was willing to go out and challenge Goliath. And David saw what's going on. He said, well, I'll fight. Nobody else will. And his brothers kind of laughed at him. And who do you think you are? You're the smallest in the family. And uh, are you going to be able to do what none of these great wars of Israel can do? But David would not be dissuaded. The king heard about it. The king tried to give Samuel his armor to protect him. And Samuel, David says, you know, I, none of this fits. I'm not used to wearing this. Look, when I was carrying for my father's sheep out in the wilds, he said, a lion came out once to attack the sheep. And on another occasion, a bear came out. And God delivered them into my hands. And God will deliver this man into my hands. So David, as you know, went down to the brook and he picked up a couple of stones from the brook and he took his sling and he stood there and faced Goliath. But David stood there, as he stood there alone before Goliath, he wasn't there. Uh, his thoughts weren't there for himself and for his own safety. His thoughts were, were, were there for the honour of the Lord. That's what mattered to him. It was his confidence in his God. It was his faith in the Lord that gave him the strength to stand there that day and to face the enemy and to overcome him. Look back at our passage back in Psalm 91, verses 3 and 4. And here's the well, beginning verse 2. He says, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noise of pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Of all the great missionaries who left friend and family behind to serve the Lord in foreign lands, perhaps no missionary faced more fears and more obstacles and experienced more of God's power to deliver than did John Payton. He was born in 1824 near Dumfries. He came to Christ, faith in Christ, when he was still a boy. When he was a little older, he went on into Glasgow. He served as a city missionary in the city of Glasgow for about 10 years. But during that time, he felt God calling him to the islands of the South Pacific. He married a woman called Mary Ann Robson. They were married in Cold Street in March of 1858. And two weeks later, they were on the ship sailing for the island of Tana in the South Pacific. In those days, the islanders on Tana were cannibals. These people lived in the grip of fear. They were afraid of their gods, they were afraid of each other. Shortly after the Patons arrived, they witnessed the first of many tribal conflicts. Five men were killed, they were cooked, and eaten by the victors. Shortly after that, uh, 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 one of the warriors, excuse me, in the same, the same instance, one of the warriors that had been killed, um, uh, uh, his widow was taken and she was strangled and buried with him so that she might accompany him into the afterlife. This is what they were dealing with. So much for the idea of the noble savage, right? John and Mary, good names, built themselves a small house with a garden to grow some fruit and vegetables. And one morning while John was out there, he awoke to find his house surrounded by warriors, threatening to kill him and his wife. John did the only thing he could think of. He knelt down before them and began to pray. And then he stood up and began to tell them, as best he could, with about the love of Jesus. One by one, the warriors walked away quietly. A few days later, he was again out there working in the garden when another warrior suddenly uh, appeared out of the forest and rushed straight at him with an axe, threatening to cut his head and slice his head in two. After a few tense moments, the warrior inexplicably stopped and walked away. And John's life was spared yet once again. The very next day, the chief showed up with an armed, uh, armed with a loaded musket. He pointed the weapon straight at John and threatened to kill him. Again, John started praying. And he just continued going about doing his daily chores. He was working in the garden, doing a few things around the house. 
the chief followed him around wherever he went for about four hours that day with the musket trained on the missionary the whole time. John just kept praying silently to himself. The musket was never fired. Those were just the first few weeks of their life in the South Pacific. Through many trials, both great and small. I didn't tell you this. Do you know that time that the warriors were surrounded all the way around the house? And they walked away inexplicably? It wasn't until later John learned what had happened. And the chief, the one, the one, I don't know if it was the chief or one of the warriors told him, he said, we came to your house, but we saw all of the people that were there protecting you. And so we walked away, and John was like, there's nobody here. And, uh, and so he assumed it was guarding the angels. They saw someone. Kept them enough to frighten them to go away. Anyways, through all the trials that they faced, both big and small, John and Mary stayed on. They experienced God's delivering power time and again. Peyton lived to be 81. He died in 1907, having seen entire islands brought to Christ, bringing an end to centuries of violence and abuse. I remember watching a show. Um, Doc Martin, the actor, what's his name? Mark Martin, Martin Clunas, Clunas or something, yeah? He was touring the South Pacific, and uh, there was a young islander that was giving him a tour uh, around the islands, and the young man made a reference to the Christian missionaries that came to the island, and Martin Clunas, for whatever reason, said, oh, I'm so sorry about that. And the minister, the guy, the, minister, the, 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 the tour guide, looked at him and said, what do you mean, basically? And he said, they brought peace. You know, we were killing each other until the missionaries came. There's a story of Lilias Trotter. Little is known of this extraordinary lady today, but in her day, John Ruskin, who was the great Victorian art critic, had singled her out as one of the most promising artistic talents of the time. He wrote the following about their first meeting. When I was in Venice in 1876, it's about the only thing that makes me now content and having gone there, two English ladies, a mother and a daughter, were staying in the same hotel, the Europa. One day, the mother sent me a pretty little note asking me if I would look at the young lady's drawings. On my somewhat sulky permission, a few were sent, in which I saw there was extremely right-minded and careful work, almost totally without knowledge. I sent back a request that the young lady might be allowed to come out sketching with me. She seemed to learn everything the instant she was shown it, and ever so much more than she was taught. Later, he wrote, she would be the greatest living painter and do things that would be immortal. Lilius and her mother were invited up to his house at Brantwood in the Lake District, where he continued to teach and develop the young lady's artistic talent. But there was something more about Lilius and her family. They were devout Christians. The more that Ruskin demanded of her, the more she felt it conflicting with her love for the Lord and her desire to serve him. Finally, one day, that spiritual complex came, came to a head. She wrote in her diary, I see as clear as daylight now. I cannot give myself to painting the way he means, and continue to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. She turned her back on worldly ambition and instead went to Algeria as a single lady missionary. During her time there, she made several trips out into the desert. Wherever she had opportunity, she would share Christ with the people that she met. For years, she kept a daily diary of her experiences and she filled it with exquisite artwork. The diaries are now kept in the Ashmolean Library in Oxford. Another lady by the name of Helen Neville found inspiration from her writings and she used the words of Lilius Trotter in a chorus that we still sing today. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Lilius Trotter was a well-born lady, brought up in a wealthy house. She lived in relative safety, enjoyed all the comforts of life in Victorian England. 
But she left all that behind to take the gospel to the desert regions of Algeria. Missionary work in a Muslim country in the 19th century could be dangerous, but especially so for a young European woman. What gave her the strength to overcome her fears? It was the knowledge that God was with her. So the promises of God's deliverance are there in the scriptures and many people have found them to be true time and again throughout their lives. And God's promises of deliverance are no less valid for us today. As we read through Psalm 91, we find that God's deliverance comes in many forms. Look at verses 5 and 6. You'll not be afraid of terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness the destruction that wastes in the new day. Deliverance from pestilence, particularly timely thought, as we're still coming out of uh, the, the COVID of the last couple of years. Sometimes God may deliver us from illness, but sometimes God chooses to afflict his children with illness of one sort or another. Why would he do that, you might ask? Why would God choose to allow you to go through time of illness? Well, perhaps because he knows that's the only way to get your attention. To get you to stop, to think, to consider your ways, to remind you of your mortality and of your need for Him. Sometimes God allows illness and disability to keep us humble, to keep us reliant upon Him. This was the experience of the Apostle Paul. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he talks about the fact that he had a physical disability. Said Paul writes that to keep me from becoming lifted up in myself because of the abundance of the revelations I'd received, a thorn was given me in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, to keep me from becoming arrogant and overly self-confident. And Paul tells us that three times he prayed to the Lord that it should depart from him, but God came back to him with this answer, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. Paul, having received this answer, understanding now what God was doing in his life, says this, Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest on me. Therefore, he says, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Not only that, we find that God can deliver us from illness, but God can also use us and our experiences to be a help and an encouragement to someone else who might be facing the same thing. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 tells us that God comforts us in our affliction so that we in turn might be able to help others to comfort those who are in an affliction with the same comfort that we ourselves receive from God. So God sometimes allows us to go through affliction of one sort or another for His purposes. But His purposes are always for the best. Even though we might not always be able to understand it in the short term. But the opposite is also true. That sometimes God chooses to deliver His people out of illness and physical incapacity. There's a wonderful promise in Exodus chapter 15. It says, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do that which is right in His sight, and you give ear to His commandments and keep His statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon you which I brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. Those things that are impossible to men are possible but we don't have to look only to the Bible for examples of God's special protection of those who trust in Him. God can and does deliver from illness. came across this episode, a little uh, uh, story uh, years ago. kept it tucked away and I thought, this is a good place to use it. In 1666 in London, <coughs> London was hit with a particularly bad epidemic of the plague. So it was a great plague of 1666. One man who lived during those times was Daniel Defoe. You might know him because he wrote the story Robinson Crusoe. Right? What people, a lot of people don't know about Daniel Defoe is that 
he was also a devout Christian. And he left the following account of God's protecting hand during the 1666 plague in London. He says, I will not undertake to say, as some do, that none of those charitable people were suffered to fall under the calamity itself. But this I may say, that I never knew any one of them that came to any ill, those who were out there helping the, the, the sick and dying. Which I mention for the encouragement of others in case of like distress. And doubtless that they that give to the poor lend to the Lord, he will repay them. Those that hazard their lives to give to the poor and to comfort and assist the poor in such misery as this may hope to be protected in the work. It was Daniel's experience that those that had gone out of God's people to help in the time of plague, that none of them, he said, nobody I knew personally was touched or harmed by the plague. Several years ago, when I was still living with my family in Alabama, my mum went in for a routine exam. <coughs> now, to give you a little background to the story, both my grandmother and my great-grandmother died from breast cancer at the age, same age of 59. And my mum, on this occasion, was also 59. She went in for her test, and the scan revealed a spot. She was asked to come back a week later and they would do a biopsy. So we and many Christians in the community began praying for my mum that whole week. She went back to doctors next week and they took another scan before doing the biopsy. And so my mum sat waiting there quietly for the results. The doctor himself came into the room, holding in his hands the pictures of both scans. The one from the week before, and the one that they just taken. He was incredulous. He said, here's a scan from last week. And he put it up. He said, you can clearly see the spot. He said, now here's the scan we took today. There's no spot to be found anywhere. He said, you're clear. There's nothing for us to take a biopsy. So, you're free to go. God delivers. God delivers us from our fears. He delivers us from our enemies. He delivers us from illness. He can deliver us from disease. But he also delivers us from something far greater. He can deliver us from the fearful consequences of sin. Many of the pleasures of this world seem to offer much, and they may for a time, but in the end they bring trouble and sorrow and guilt. We can live out our lives as we please from day to day, but the fear of death still hangs over us all. You can't escape it. And if you stop to think about it, it can bring with it a sense of futility and hopelessness, anxiety. Our fears can weigh us down like a heavy chain and can keep us from realizing the potential for which God made us. We need to realize that Jesus came to set us free. He came to deliver us from the, foul, the, the fear of death and, and the power of sin. Hebrews chapter 2 tells us that just as we are made of flesh and blood, so Christ himself became like us, so that he might die for us, and in dying, deliver, deliver us from the power of death. Him that hold, held the power of death is the devil, and to deliver us from the fear of death. Jesus destroyed the power of sin when he died on the cross and rose again from the grave the third day. And still to this day, any and all who come to him in faith, he delivers from the power of sin and all its evils. And we don't just experience the delivering power of Christ at the moment of our salvation, but we continue to draw on his strength and grace from day to day throughout the rest of our lives. Christ saves us from sin and he continues to deliver us. He delivers us from the wiles of the devil, from temptation, from sin, from pride, from self and selfish desires. If we choose to rely on ourselves to get through life, we will struggle and we will fail. We might be able to turn over a new leaf for a time, but true victory comes as we get close to God, as we learn to trust in Christ, as we take all our trials and troubles to Jesus. And we yield control of our lives to Him. It's in drawing closer to Jesus that we find in Him the grace to 
overcome. The Khmar people of Northeast India were once known as some of the worst headhunters in the British Empire. In 1871, a warrior faction from the tribe beheaded over 500 tea plantation workers and British soldiers. Years later, in February 1910, a missionary from Wales named Watkin Roberts arrived in the region armed with only a copy of the New Testament. He spent only five days there with the Mar people before moving on to other parts of the region. But in those five days, he taught them about Jesus and the Gospel of John. Through that single missionary visit, Changwa and a few other members of the tribe became Christians. Changya had a son. His name was Rochunga. Even from an early age, dad, the dad could see that there was something special about his son. And he began to believe that Rochunga could become the, the instrument that God could use to bring the Bible to his people. So he began to pray that God would guide and bless it meant that for Rochunga to receive an education, he'd have to go off to the mission school. Mission school was 96 miles away, over mountain and through thick forests. And Rochunga was only 10 years old. How old is uh, Hugo? You're eight, not quite 10. If you can just imagine a 10 year old boy having to walk all 96 miles by himself through the mountains and the jungles so he could go to school. And you can imagine he was filled with fears while he did it. He was afraid <coughs> of what might happen if Himnati, the local leader, the guy, the boys in the village, might come across him in the forest on his way. He was afraid of trekking all the way through the jungle on his own. What would happen if he bumped into some wild tigers or, a, or an elephant or, a, or, or some monkey uh, 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 blocking his path? He claimed John 3.16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He claimed that verse for salvation, and Rogue continued to trust in Christ now, as he set out through the rainforest. He prayed to God for protection. He made it all the way, safely to the mission school. And he proved to be a bright student. Rogue was eventually sent on to the Bible Training Institute in Glasgow. One of the former ministers here in our church went there for his training as well years ago. And then, uh, from there, with the help of Billy Graham, he went on to Eton College in the States. Rowe eventually translated the Bible into his native language. And returned to the village in 1958 with copies of the New Testament. But then he realized, when he got there, of course, that many of his people couldn't read. So through the tile of his Charles Everett of Rowe and his wife, Maui, they started Christian schools in 85 villages, set up seven Christian high schools, two junior colleges, and even a Bible seminary. And today, and I've checked it out, it's absolutely true, the Mar people of Northeast India are among, have one of the highest literacy rates of any ethnic group in India. Rowe faced many fears and obstacles throughout his life, but he was determined to follow the Lord. He cried unto the Lord, and the Lord delivered him out of all his troubles. I wonder this morning, I don't know where you are in your life or what you're dealing with, what might be holding you back from stepping out courageously and openly for the Lord. Let's claim the promises of God's Word. And let's seek to live for Him. When verse 1 is true, when you are dwelling in the secret place of the Most High, when you are close to the Lord, then all the promises of this psalm become yours to claim. Amen. The Lord, grant us the strength to trust in Him and not fear. Let's take our hymn book.